Hello everyone, welcome back. I got some really good ones for you today on this Monday, October 30th, 2023. A lot's been going on with the markets, economy, geopolitics. That's what we're gonna be focusing on for this evening's video. So welcome back, glad you made it. Glad we can hang out together and let's dive right into these markets, shall we? We'll start with the bond market because it's the largest market on planet Earth, the mother of all markets. We'll start with that 10 year yield. 10 year yield is uh, hanging out right now at about 4.9%. I'd say a little bit too high for the stock market's liking, you know, talking about these rising yields, rising rates, rising dollar, kind of putting downward pressure on risk assets. You saw that in the three major US stock indices last week. We kind of grinded lower for the duration of the week. However, we did see a pop in the three major indices today, right about at the close. Dow Jones put on about 500 points. What I think that is, is uh, Markets are looking forward to the Fed meeting on Wednesday, and I think the Fed's gonna be holding rates steady. The market's assigning kind of a 98% chance right now that the Fed's gonna be holding interest rates steady on Wednesday, and, and I think that's bullish overall for asset prices. You know, We're getting to a point now where we got maybe you know, no interest rate hike coming on Wednesday, maybe one or two more hikes, no, November, December timeframe, and, and we've tentatively, in my opinion, will be, will be hitting pretty much peak rates. We'll, the rate hiking cycle will be peaking out and then the Fed will be holding rates steady for as long as they can get away with until something ultimately goes wrong. And then they're gonna have to start cutting interest rates again. Overall, once the Fed starts to cut interest rates again, in my opinion, that's gonna be rocket fuel for things like the stock market, real estate, gold, oil, crypto. Um, so these interest rate hikes put downward pressure on risk assets and these interest rate cuts are gonna be rocket fuel. We're, we're finishing up with the hikes Market's kind of getting giddy over that because it knows what's coming next is, is probably holding rates steady or cuts, you know, and, and we, you know, maybe the market too is anticipating on Wednesday that Powell is going to sound a little bit more concerned in his speech about the health of the banking sector. You know, we have these bond portfolios being held by all these major banks. We're talking the big boys, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, Citi, Bank of America, you know, they're all sitting on a ton of bonds that are that have really low yields and so the value of those bonds today has fallen a lot you know a lot of these bond portfolios are down like 10 11 12 15 percent in a year you know for bonds being a really conservative asset class that you know getting beaten up pretty good for a conservative asset class. And then you look at something like Amazon or Google and you're like, they don't, that doesn't seem to be affected. You know, and that's supposed to be riskier than the bond market and they're, they're holding up a lot better, you know? So these bond portfolios guys have been bleeding like a stuck pig for a while now. And we're getting to a point where Powell's worried that if he keeps raising interest rates and raising these bond yields, it's just gonna keep crushing these banks. So Powell's gotta back off a little bit. Um, you know, markets kind of, like kind of nudging them like, yo, stop raising interest rates so aggressively. You're really messing my game up. Which, uh, you know, side note, it is kind of interesting. People get the idea, oh, the Fed is the dog that wags the market tail. So the Fed policy and the Fed stays independent ultimately has knock on effects in the market. But sometimes guys, the, the market's kind of the dog and it's wagging the Fed tail and it's telling the market, you know, the uh, who the Fed works for, these large member banks who own the Federal Reserve System and get a monthly dividend, you know, they start telling the Fed what to do. And maybe sometimes like the Treasury, Janet Yellen over there at the Treasury is like the dog wagging the Fed tail, you know, so, so how they, you know, this revolving door between the Federal Reserve, the Treasury, and then the banks, you know, they, they all kind of pass responsibility around and, and kind of hide and, and conceal who's really the headwaters for policy and who, who's really calling the shots here, you know? So I think we're at a place now where Powell's life's getting kind of difficult because Jerome Powell at the Federal Reserve wants to keep raising interest rates to get inflation under control, but he's running into a situation where the major banks are like, stop, stop. And it looks like he's gonna stop and it looks like, uh, you know, at least for a while and it looks like the market's really like that. So. Pay attention on Wednesday as as the Fed concludes their their meeting and Powell gives his press conference. You know the algorithms are really going to go into overdrive on Wednesday. Wouldn't recommend trading like day trading a Fed day because the high frequency traders and algos are really going to eat your lunch. Like up is down, down is up. You know it takes 72, 96 hours for the market to digest a federal rate hike decision. You know so. 
keep an eye on Wednesday. It could get kind of gnarly. And in the meantime, stocks kind of pricing in no more interest rate hikes and kind of moving up on that and getting giddy about it, getting giddy about uh, peak rates. And that's kind of what you're dealing with. Crude got smacked uh, last few trading days and is down to about $82 a barrel. But, you know, in my opinion, you know, crude's not done making its run higher. Crude oil really likes war. Hate to say that. It's like there's no other way to put it. The Dow Jones components like war. The S&P 500 likes war. It weakens the dollar. It, it gives all these Dow components like Boeing you hear overhead right now or... You know, it gives them something to do. I think 90% of Boeing's revenue comes from the federal government. So as the government m moves to more of like a wartime posture, that gives the government a lot more spending they have to do. It kind of weakens the dollar because it's not like they have this cash in a piggy bank and they break it on the ground. You know, they got to print money, you know, print dollars, print currency. Money is Bitcoin, gold, silver. Remember that little fun fact for you print currency, dollars are currency, not, not sound money. Certainly not sound money or a store of value. But anyway, war is good for the beast system, the, the 401k system, the pension, the Ponzi's, the Dow Jones components, government spending, you know, all of those things kind of weaken the dollar and kind of prop up uh, not just the defense contractors, but kind of prop everything up. But, you know, look at those defense contractors too. Northrop Grumman stocks trading like Bitcoin. Raytheon, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, you know, I don't own any of these companies and I don't really want to sell my soul, but you know, take a look at the stock charts. They really respond favorably to war and some of these other companies do too. You know, even Honeywell like makes bombs. You'd be surprised uh, what otherwise, you know, pretty, pretty chill and consumer oriented companies are in the back door doing a lot of dirty work for the, the beast system, which must continue to feed, whether it be on the meat of the middle class or, or dead Ukrainians or dead Israelis, sad guys, but war and the beast system go together like peanut butter and jelly. You know, I'm sure Black Rock's got its camel's nose under the tent there in Ukraine and Israel and is setting up their whole restructuring, you know? Um, so yeah, crude smacked, but I don't think it's gonna last. Uh, so, you know, you could look at mega cap energy stocks, like not a buy or sell recommendation. We don't do that on this channel, but you could look at like the big boys, like Exxon Mobil, Chevron, uh, BP, you know, some of these energy companies that have like half trillion dollar market caps, you know, the, the real dominant players, they look to benefit from these wars, you guys, which is super sad. Uh, dollar moved a little bit lower today. VIX pulled back, so the fear gauge came down. The dollar came down. Gold came down a little bit. And that's kind of the green light for those three major U.S. stock indices to move up. They like the dollar lower. They like volatility coming down. And they like maybe gold kind of taking the back seat. So it gave the three major indices an excuse to kind of move up, even in the face of these uh, rising yields. You know, bond yields at you know, 10 year yield at 4.9%. Stock market's been very resilient, guys, because who wants to hold bonds? We don't like bonds on this channel. We don't like cash on this channel. We don't like, if you hold bonds or cash, guys, you're just a creditor to the US government. Tell me, you know, tell me how that's been going this last couple of years since they've added so much to the money supply and gotten involved in all these wars. You know, we, we just don't have cash laying around for them, guys. Got Bitcoin hanging out at 34,500. That's awesome. I love to see it. Got Ethereum hanging out at 1,809. Uh, Link in the 11s now. That's pretty good to see. Uh, Pepe moving up. You know, two videos ago, I wore a Pepe shirt and we're probably up like 60% since then. And then, um, or was it the last video? Really? I was wearing a Pepe shirt in the last video, you guys, and we're up like 60% since then. And then two videos ago, I was wearing a Link shirt and Link's probably up like 60% over that same time as well too. So, you know, total coincidence, but there's your little Easter eggs. Good to see Pepe, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Link, you know, some of these others like Solana and stuff doing well. Not a buy or sell recommendation, but uh, I really like, uh, you know, crypto and Bitcoin and it's all good stuff to me. I think, the, I think Sand and Mana might make a comeback too. Uh, Sandbox and Decentraland, go ahead and take a look at the metaverse. Uh, metaverse is, you know, it's pretty well on life support right now, but maybe we're bottoming, you know, maybe the metaverse isn't dead. Maybe 
this has just been a horrible bear and ultimately all roads still lead to the metaverse so maybe not though maybe the metaverse is something to avoid and perhaps even resist so uh we got Jamie Dimon at JP Morgan selling about 10% of his shares of JP Morgan. Doesn't tell me anything though. It's like, oh, JP Morgan, you know, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of JP Morgan just sold 10% of his shares. Like a market crash must be coming. I don't buy it, guys. JP, Jamie Dimon is generally a terrible indicator to go with. So if Jamie Dimon tells you something, one day he's probably telling you the truth and then right when you're like hey he's actually right a lot he lies you know one day a, a storm is coming and then the next day oh everything's great so i would take everything that comes out of jamie diamond's mouth with like a whole shaker of salt not to mention guys he's trying to keep you on the wrong side of the trade he doesn't work for you okay he's part of the revolving door the beast system you know the fed doesn't work for you you know jerome powell talks a lot in these press conferences about doing right by the American public and the American people and that's his focus and getting inflation down to 2% is his focus and this, that and the other. Totally not, guys. That's a lie. The, the Federal Reserve works for the member banks who own them. And those member banks, there's a ton of them, but if you look at the largest holders of the Federal Reserve system, it's JP Morgan, Jamie Dimon, Wells Fargo, Citi, Goldman Sachs, BlackRock. You know, these are, you know, Capital One. U.S. Bank, PNC Financial. These, these banks own the Federal Reserve. They collect a dividend from the Federal Reserve system. Jerome Powell does not work for you. He works for them. You know what I mean? So, any, you know, Jamie Dimon sold some shares, but he still got the other 90% of his shares of J.P. Morgan. Guys, Jamie Dimon, with, when it comes to Jamie Dimon's calls, if he goes long, I'll go short. When he, if he goes short, I'll go long. That That's how much faith I'd put in anything that... Uh, you know, comes out of Jamie Dimon's mouth or what his actions even. he He's just trying to keep you off balanced and confused. I truly do believe that. I mean, talk about too big to fail. You know, JP Morgan's got like $2 trillion in deposits. So if anything ever goes wrong for JP Morgan and they pick up the phone and call the Fed or the Treasury, believe me, they're, they're, they're going to get an answer and they're going to get whatever help they need. I mean, look at what happened with Silicon Valley banking crisis back in like March or April time frame. You know, the Fed came and FDIC and Treasury came right to the rescue for these uh, larger institutions. They didn't care so much about the fate of Silicon Valley Bank because those were just tech entrepreneurs and people that were sitting at the wrong table. They were, you know, in the wrong circles. But if you're JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, PNC, you know, and, and you call the Federal Treasury, hey, somebody's gonna answer the phone and they're gonna be more than happy to work with you because that that's who the Fed works for. Uh, so yeah, Fed Day on Wednesday, talked a little bit about, you know, crypto. I guess we could chill and talk a little bit more about uh, crypto for a little bit. Bitcoin up to close to 35,000, you know, probably $15,000 worth of electricity to mine a Bitcoin. So we're trading at about two times the cost of production. That tells me that it's not undervalued. I, like if Bitcoin traded to cost like 15, 16,000, I would call it undervalued there. And then if Bitcoin were at like 50 or 60 right now, you know, maybe we're, we're getting a little bubbly. So here at 35, two times the cost of production, doesn't tell me it's a bubble, doesn't tell me it's under overvalued. You know, it's just kind of like fair price for Bitcoin right now. So I like Bitcoin, uh, but if I bought here, I, I wouldn't be surprised either way if we moved up or down. Ethereum at 1800 is pretty awesome, you guys. Um, no, Ethereum is still the number one altcoin, pretty much. You have all these ETH killers like Solana and Avalanche. And I, I do like some of the ETH killers and own some of them, but ETH hitting $20,000 once it becomes the same market cap as Apple is something that I totally could see happening in the mid to long term. So $20,000 ETH, if it can grow to the size of one company, you know, Apple. ETH can just match Apple's market cap. You're already at 20,000. I think that's totally reasonable. Could happen in the next five, 10 years, something like that. And I, I don't see any of these ETH killers really posing much of a threat. Put things kind of in perspective. 
the Ethereum blockchain has 750,000 validators. And then their competition like Cardano, Avalanche, you know, the Cardano has like maybe 3,000 validators. Avalanche has like 1,100. And then ETH has 750,000. So it's like, you know, the ETH network is 10, 20, 30 X the size of the market cap of some of these ETH killers. So good luck, you know, I like Solana. I like Avalanche. I like Link, uh, although Link's not really a ETH killer. Link's more of a blockchain agnostic, smart contracts and oracles coin. You know, they're working with everyone basically. I really like Link and I really like Sergi, the guy that runs Chainlink. Um, I, I'm a Link Marine, I, I was a real Marine, so like being a Link Marine's cool too, you know what I mean? Kind of with that culture, I, I, I really think Chainlink could have a bright future, Ethereum could have a bright future, Bitcoin, you know, some just some things to think about, you guys, but not buy or sell recommendations. And if, if, if one of these altcoins, other than Ethereum, were to trade to like dang near zero tomorrow, like I wouldn't be that surprised, you know, so don't be going all in on these like altcoins with a tiny small cap micro cap projects that that you know only are worth like maybe 50 million dollars like be careful with that you know bitcoin's got a market cap of half a trillion so that's a pretty large monetary network that's gonna be pretty impossible to displace and i'm gonna stand by my one million dollar bitcoin price target for the next 10 20 years something like that so onwards and upwards for uh, cryptos. But that's really all I wanted to discuss with you guys today. We kind of discussed what's going on with markets, what's going on with the Fed, uh, geopolitics, how, how war kind of affects the stock market, the Dow components, positively for better or worse. You know, this whole idea that, oh, war broke out, the stock market crashes. It's like, guys, no. <laughs> The dollar becomes faker when war breaks out and this drives asset prices higher. You know, I'm more concerned about crashing up, okay? I'm not concerned about these stock market crashes. You know, I'm sure if you go on a lot of YouTube channels, it's like, when's the crash coming? You know, it's just a bunch of people like that promote staying in cash and promote inaction, just waiting around for a crash so they can pick up those cheap shares. Yeah, not with that, guys. I've never done one single crash video and I'm really glad I haven't because my biggest concern is crashing up markets crashing up median home prices continuing continuing to rise from like 400k now to like 800k you know that i'm much more concerned about that because wages aren't keeping up the middle class isn't keeping up you know we have all these consumers that are just completely saddled with debt whether it's credit card debt student loan debt auto debt and um they're just getting priced out of these markets the real estate market you know even one share of BlackRock's like 600 bucks now, you know? One share of Costco is like 500. One share of Northrop Grumman's like 500 shares. What are you going to do for retirement? Like buy one share? You know what I mean? I'm more worried about that, guys, than I am uh, market crashes. But if I do think a crash will happen, you know, I'll be the first one to come out here and let you guys know. It's not like I'm just a perma bull. I'm not afraid to see dollar strength in a real scenario where markets could begin to buckle. And if I thought that were about to happen, I would come out here and let you guys know. So that's really all I got for you guys for right now. I hope this video finds you doing well. Thanks for hanging out with me. I hope you got something out of this and we're just going to carry on. All right. We'll reconvene as things progress and we're just going to keep going. Till next time.